So let's go to the Lord in prayer. So, Father, again, I thank you with all of my heart. I praise you, Lord, that I am uh, here standing and breathing and living, Father. That, Lord, that you would have your way in this life that I'm living. My life, Lord, is not mine, but this life that I live is yours. And so, Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would utilize me in any way you see fit, Lord. From here on out, Lord, to my very last breath, Lord, I pray, Lord, that it would all be dedicated to you for your glory alone. And Lord, you would just use me, Lord. No matter how great or how small of a, of a congregation or of an audience that you would give me to teach and to speak to and to fellowship with, Lord, I will be faithful to you, Lord, because everything we do is unto you. And so, Lord, uh, as we get into your word this morning, Lord, I know, Lord, that this uh, scriptures that we're reading are uh, dealing with a, a small church, so to speak. And that is what we are, Lord. We're part of the great church of Jesus Christ worldwide. But, Lord, um, we're here and we're attentive and we want to hear what you would have to say. So, Holy Spirit, you speak and you have your way. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And all God's people say, amen, amen and amen. Again, I would like to welcome those that are watching this video at this time. A letter from John. That is the message this morning. A letter from John. We are out of 2 John and the book of 3 John. Um, we will be in 2 John chapter 4. I'm kidding. There's only one chapter. <laughs> Bless you. Bless you. Uh, somebody sneezed in here. And so, amen. I want to talk to you this, this, uh, this day uh, from the Apostle John in this word. At the time of this writing of this book, John, who was a, the youngest of all the, of all the apostles, John was the youngest. And he was a very young man when Jesus passed away, died, and rose from the dead. And uh, it was John who was at the feet of Jesus shortly before his death, where Jesus tells this disciple, he gives Mary over to the, for John to have responsibility and custody of her, because if not, Mary, Jesus' earthly mother, would have, uh, she was already a widow, but now she would have, her, her oldest son would not be there to, to, to help her. And so that, that's just the compassion that the Lord Jesus Christ had as he was dying on the cross. He saw his mother right there, and he's like, you know, in a sense, it's mom, I'm leaving you in the hands of one of the best men that I've ever known. And that was this young apostle, this young future apostle named John. And so now here is John at an old age. He's uh, near the end of his life. And uh, pretty much all the other apostles have been martyred. As a matter of fact, John was the only apostle that was not martyred for his faith in Christ. He was the only one that died of natural causes. And so there's a, uh, there's a reason for that? Of course there is. Um, and we may not know the exact reasoning, but this was the Lord's beloved. That's what the Lord called him. And the Lord loved this young man. The Lord loved them all, but there was something special about this young man, now an old man. And in Second and Third John, John is speaking to two individuals, one in Second John and the other individual, a man, in Third John. These two people, a woman and a man, they were uh, leaders of the church. It was more, a, more or less, it was a house church. It was not a church like what we have today where uh, the buildings and all of that, but no, it was a house church. It was a small group, a small setting, a small meeting. And so just like the big churches, so do the small churches, even today, in John's day and today, they meet the same opposition, the same trials, the same tribulations that other churches meet. And so I, I believe, you know, we are a small church, you know, part of the big church of Jesus Christ. But I believe that as we come down to, to the end of 2019, going into 2020, you know, 2020 is perfect vision. And this is the Holy Spirit, by the way. And I believe 2020 is perfect vision, right? I believe, I believe that God's people need to finally see correctly. In the year 2020, we have to see through the spiritual eyes of God 
the truth. We have to have a love for truth. We have to first desire truth in order to have a love for truth. If you do not have a desire for the truth of God, you will not have a love for it. You will not seek after it. You'll, you know, and so I, I know I can speak for many uh, Christians, uh, myself included, that you just sometimes you get to a point in your life where you're sick and tired of being sick and tired. There's more to life for the Christian life than, than some of us are experiencing right now. And Jesus says himself that the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but he came, Christ came, that you may have life and life abundantly. Now, it's not made up of, abundant life is not made up of material possessions, but abundant life is made up of love, joy, peace, patience, guidance, uh, faithfulness, goodness, and self-control. That's what these things are made of. Abundant life is made of these things, and this is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you don't have any of those things, from love all the way to self-control, this is a time that we need to examine our walk. As we look in 2 John chapter 1, uh, John begins to speak to the elder of this small church. It was verse 1, the elder, that's John, to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth. And not only I, but also all those who have known the truth, because of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. Now, in this passage that we're going to be reading this morning, it's not only going to talk about doctrine, but it's also going to talk about the Antichrist. It's going to deal with things in, such, in two short chapters. It deals with so much. And it deals with love. It deals, it deals with unity. Basically, what the church needs to understand today is in these two short books. Incredible. He is speaking to this lady who is, again, leading this congregation. It's a small group setting. And he says, you know, they're bound by truth. And Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So they, are, they love the truth. They know the truth. They are, they're staying. They're abiding in the truth. And the truth will be with them forever. And that's Jesus Christ. You will know the truth. And what? The truth will what? Set you free. You want to live in freedom today? You need to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Those who are bound by sin, those who are bound by um, habitual uh, sin, a, a, a repetitious, vicious cycle of wrong choices in your life. And I'm speaking to the Christian. You know, you, you, you know that you could be bound like a slave all over again. Whether you're doubting God, whether you're angry at God, that's, that is a sin. Whether you're worrying, Jesus says, don't worry. Don't worry about what's going to happen. If you're following him, if you're being a good steward of your time, of your talent, and of your money, your treasure, if you're, if you're honoring God, if you're worshiping God as a good steward of these things, you're always going to be in the right place, and your needs will always be met. God is not a liar. But if you're finding yourself living week to week, then there's, there may be an issue. Now, somebody could say, well, Michael, you're preaching a prosperity gospel. No, I'm not. I don't believe in the prosperity message that is out there. It is an absolute false doctrine. But I do believe God wants you to prosper, not just spiritually, but physically as well. Look, we're going to read this, and we're going to find this in 3 John. But right now, in verse 2, it says, Grace, mercy, and peace will be with you. From God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and in love. Now, this is so important to understand. We have a relationship with God in truth, and it's true love. The Bible says that God first loved us. God chose us. He chose you. He loves you. He loved you first, and he still loves you today. And we may fail him, we may fail each other, but God never fails. God never fails. You may have some of the most horrible things happen in your life. You know, some of you have had a rough life. Some of you may have had a rough year, a rough couple of years. But God is still on his throne. And God is still merciful. And no eye has seen and no ear has heard what Christ Jesus has prepared for those who love him. Amen? Amen. I think about my daughter, Gracie. She's with the Lord now. And I will see her again. And our unborn child, Gabriel. I, I think about these two. These are my treasures in heaven. These are our treasures in heaven. Amen? Amen. No eye has seen, no ear has heard what Christ has prepared for those who love him. Store your treasures in heaven. See, that's the truth. Jesus, through Jesus, through a right relationship with Christ, 
we can store treasures. Look, verse 4. I rejoice greatly, he says, that I have found some, not all of your children, but some. <laughs> wow. That I have found some of your children walking in truth. As we received commandment from the Father, and now I plead with you, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment to you, but that which we have heard from the beginning, that we love one another. This is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. You should walk in truth, and you should walk in love. We don't always do that, do we? Sometimes we have felt God in those areas. This presents the proper expression of, or evidence of love to God. If we say we love God, we're going to be living in truth and we're going to be living in love. Amen? Yeah. See, this is, the, this is that commandment. This is love, that we walk according to His commandments. Jesus says, if you love me, obey my commandments. You need to know the written word of God. You can't just trust the preacher to tell you something because that preacher may not be living right. You need to know the scriptures for yourself. Look what John 13, verse 34 and 35 say. In John 13, verse 34 and 35, it says this. A new commandment I give to you, Jesus says, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also have loved one another. By this, all, meaning the world, will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another what is the greatest measure of our love for God when we love our brothers and sisters in Christ when we're there for them no matter what when we, when we backstab and when we fail and we gossip and we're and we're envious of them and we compete with them that's not love and that shows that we don't have no love for God and so the way we treat our brothers and sisters in Christ regardless if they're in this church or that church the way we treat them shows that we really love God. That is the evidence right there. Jesus said, the world will know my disciples by the love they have for one another. Now, this is important to understand because we're living in a loveless society today. Matthew 24 even says it, where Jesus says, because, he's talking about the last day. He says, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of many will grow cold. When somebody has stabbed you in the back, when somebody has done you wrong and you hold unforgiveness, whether it be to people or even to God, it leads to wickedness in your heart. And because of that, you, you begin to not love people, not love God. And that is the signs of the time today. And so regardless of what has happened, your children may not talk to you no more. Your, your spouse may not be in the in the right relationship anymore with you your, your your parents have neglected you whatever it may be god is still on his throne Amen. and god has not abandoned you and you are not alone because when you were reborn again you were born into the family of god and you are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses amen, amen? Yeah. and so just when you think you've lost you know you look around you and you have the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You have the written word of God. Amen. What more do we need? What more do we need? And we should not grow weary. We should not grow faint. We should not, we should not imitate and mirror the people of this world, but our Father who is in heaven. We should always hold on to love, to faith, and to hope. And these are things that we need to... Uh, become familiar with once again we've forgotten some of these things and we need to get into the scriptures we need to get into the prayer room so that we can live by faith that we can have a, a hope that resides within us that can that, that the fire within us the fire of god cannot be extinguished by the plans and the schemes of satan jesus says you have not because you are asking not ask and you shall receive now, it's not talking about the riches of this world or the material things. There's nothing wrong with riches and material wealth as long as they honor Jesus. Amen? Amen? 
And so John is talking to these people. He's talking to this little congregation. And the first thing he's talking about is love. In verse 7, he begins to say, beware of antichrist deceivers. You know, from the beginning, there are always people who are against the church. You know, if they were against Jesus, they're going to be against you, Christian. Amen. Amen? For many deceivers, verse 7 says, 2 John 1, 7, for many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we do not lose things we worked for, but that we may receive a full reward. Now, what, what is this doctrine that the Antichrist, that those who are, that, that belong to an, that there are many types of, uh, uh, how do I say this? There's not just one Antichrist. There are many Antichrists, meaning people who are against Jesus. Okay? In, first, in the book of 1 John, the book of 1 John teaches that Many of these antichrists, these types of antichrists, these people came from the church. They were raised in the church. And as they grew, their hearts became corrupt and wicked. And they left. And, and they began to teach a false doctrine. Now, John, in this short chapter, is speaking to this lady saying, watch out for the antichrist, many types of antichrist. And he names a doctrine. And this doctrine is, those who do not confess that Jesus has come in the flesh. Now, what is that doctrine called? It's called the incarnation of Christ. The incarnation of Christ, meaning where God became man. Now, there's another doctrine out there called kenosis. K-E-N-O-S-I-S. -S, kenosis. And the kenosis doctrine is a foundational doctrine for many false uh, cults within Christianity today. And they believe, that kenosis theory believes that when God became fully man, Jesus, when Jesus came to the earth, that he put aside his divinity. And he was 100% man, and he was zero God. That is a false doctrine. Because the Bible teaches that he was fully man and fully God. You want me to prove it to you? I'll prove it to you right now. Because when Jesus was on the cross, and before the cross, he said, I lay down my life, and I have the power to raise it up. He didn't say God. He said, I do. He was speaking to him in regards to his deity, his part of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Jesus never, ever laid aside his deity. Now, please, this is a preaching, but a teaching message. The kenosis theory says that he laid aside his deity. But Jesus did not do that because when he was on the cross, the Bible says he, Jesus, gave up his spirit. And he raised himself from the dead. Now, how can that be if he was 100% man only? Because no man can fully give up their spirit. Only God can. And only God can raise it up. Therefore, they teach a false doctrine. This other false doctrine that we're talking about, it's a denial of the incarnation. And what does this denial of the incarnation mean? It means that, it means that he did not come in the flesh. He came spiritually. He, he, or, or another thing is, you know, that another doctrine out there is that when he rose from the dead, he rose spiritually, not physically. That is another false doctrine. And Jehovah Witnesses believe in that false doctrine. That he rose spiritually, not physically. Well, Michael, what's the big deal with these doctrines? There's a very big, great big deal because they lead to further false teachings. And we wonder why a lot of Christians are depressed today. And why a lot of Christians are confused. And they live roller coaster lives up and down because they don't know what the truth is. And what John is saying in the beginning of this chapter, what is he saying? He says, we hold to the truth because the truth abides in us and will be with us forever. The early Christians, they knew what the truth was. Do you? When you know what truth is, you look at Islam today as little children, they're taught the five pillars of the Islamic faith. They're taught these things. When you're raised up in the Catholic Church, you're taught the prayers, the rosary, and all of these things. 
And, and I still, I was raised in the Catholic Church. I'm 40, going to be 48. I know I look 25, but I'm going to be 48. <laughs> yeah, I, I wish, I wish. <laughs> but, but I still remember to, these days, to this day, those prayers, the Catholic prayers, you know, it, it, it's the prayer of Hail Mary, Hail Mary, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us now at the hour of our deaths. Amen. That, that, is the, that, that is the Hail Mary prayer, you know? They've got other prayers, but, I, uh, but those were embedded into me as a child. But what are we embedding into our children, Christian? The biblical truths that exist from the Word of God. Are we teaching them this? Are we teaching ourselves? Are we reminding ourselves of this? John was speaking to the early Christians. They knew the truth. Amen? You're not gonna, if you know the truth, when an Antichrist comes around, you won't be deceived. But if you don't know the truth, when the final Antichrist shows up, woe to you. Because the prophet Daniel witnessed the final Antichrist in the book of Daniel. And the prophet Daniel, when he saw this, and it's in it, even in our future, when the prophet Daniel saw this, it said that he lay ill for three weeks. Here's the great mighty prophet Daniel one of the men I've never met that I respect so much for. He's one of my favorites. I know you're not supposed to have favorites, but I just, I love Daniel. Incredible man of God. And, and here he is. He's laying ill for three weeks. Why? Because he saw what we're fixing to see. And if we're not near in our spiritual walk as Daniel was, and if it tripped up Daniel, what will it do for those who are not prepared today? you will be deceived because you don't know truth. This is a warning, guys. Much of the church lacks biblical sense. We don't know the gospel. That's why we can't even live the gospel if you don't know it. Look at verse 8. 2 John 1, 8. It says, Look to yourselves that we do not lose these things we worked for, but that we may receive a full reward. Now, he's not talking about salvation by works. That's not what he is talking about. He's talking about, you know, as a matter of fact, the Word of God, the New Testament says, we are saved by only by the work of Jesus. Period. That's it. You're saved by grace. That's it. But you are saved unto good works. You're saved by Jesus' work so that you can do good things. And what does James say in the book of James? He says, I will show you my faith by evidence of the things I've done because I believe in Jesus in his work. And so you don't ever question your faith in Jesus. What you do is you question whether you are sincere with Jesus about the decision you made. You don't question what Jesus did. You question what you're doing. Look, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5 through 6. It says this here. Paul says to the church, Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Question mark. Unless indeed you are disqualified. But I trust that you will know that we are not disqualified. So, that along with 2 John 1, 8, it says, look to yourselves. L look at verse 8 again. Look to yourselves. Look to yourself. What does that mean? It means examine yourself, that we do not lose these things. What, what, what does no eye has seen, no ear has heard, what Christ has prepared for those who love him. There are great rewards that blow away this entire universe. There are great rewards for the Christian when they go to be with the Lord forever. There are great rewards there that will blow away this entire universe. The world is wanting you to hold on to the riches and to the glory, keeping up with the Kardashians. Amen? That's what the world wants you to do, to be involved in the daily gossip of all the morning talk shows that are on TV and are on the radio. But that destroys our soul. Believe me, I know. But God is faithful and God seeks after you morning, noon and night. God, Jesus Christ, he does not give up. 
He does not slumber. He does not sleep. He is not lazy. He does not grow weary. He is the mighty one. He is the Alpha and the Omega. The first and the last, the beginning and the end. The one who was and is and is to come. His name is Jesus. Amen. His name is Jesus. And that's my Savior. That's my Lord. That's my King. Amen. That's my God. And there's no one like him. He is wonderful. He is mighty. He is holy. He is awesome. His presence is unthinkable. When he speaks, the whole creation and the whole universe will seize. By just a spoken word, by just a, a little move of his hand, time as we know it can stop. He is, he is the Lord. He's not the baby in the manger. He's not the guy that's still on the cross. He's my Lord. He's my King. His name is Jesus. Hallelujah. So stay in the doctrine of Christ. Look at verse 9. Whoever transgresses, meaning whoever sins, whoever fails, and does not abide, meaning stay, abide means stay and does not abide in the doctrine of Jesus Christ does not have God he who abides stays in the doctrine of Christ has both the father and the son if anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine the biblical doctrine the truths do not receive him into your house nor greet him for he who greets him shares in his evil deeds you're condoning something that's called an ecumenical movement today. Where today, even in evangelical circles, we're seeing ministers reaching out to Catholics, to Islam, Islam to Buddhists. And what does the Word of God say? If, no, if you do not abide in the doctrine of Jesus Christ, do not welcome them. Because you'll be lost, and you're going to share in their evil deeds. And that's why people of the world will look at a Christian today and say, you're so narrow-minded. You're, you're, you're such bigoted you're, you're a, you, you are a hater of people because you, you say that your faith is the only faith that's right because that's what Jesus says about himself Jesus Christ said he is the way the truth and the life and no man comes unto the father except through Christ alone now you better understand that because the world is fixing to call that in there is a final antichrist who is coming and everyone will be tempted to receive that mark Everyone will have to bow down to this Antichrist if they want to buy, eat, sell, trade, be visible in public. Deny Christ and you can continue having life. You're going to remember the words of this preacher. Because I tell you on the authority of the word of God, this day will come. It will come to the shores of America. It will come to the shores of every nation. Beware of antichrist deceivers. Do not greet them. Verse 12. Having many things to write to you, I did not wish to do so with paper and ink, but I hope to come to you and speak face to face that our joy may be full. The children of your elect sister greet you. Amen. Third John. The book of Third John now. He says, The elder, that's John, to the beloved Gaius, whom I love. Look at that in truth I love you in truth and again I've been speaking about this truth I love you in the name of Jesus I love you in Jesus name beloved I pray now look verse 2 I pray John says that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers look at that that is not the prosperity gospel right there. See, because the prosperity gospel centers solely on material wealth and blessings, an accumulation of things. The greater things you have, the more blessed you must be. But what is John saying in verse 2? You can keep that up, please. What is he saying in verse 2? He says, look, that as you prosper in all things in health, you also prosper in soul. God wants you. Please get this through your head. Please, through your heart. 
the Lord God Almighty wants, look, His children, His disciples, His followers. That's what this is talking about in context of this chapter. He's not talking about all people of the world. Because if that was the case, then God could say, I want you to prosper and have nice things, but you don't have to believe in me in the name of Jesus Christ. That's not what this is saying. He's speaking to the Christian. He's speaking to the believers. He's saying, as your soul, as your soul prospers, your body must prosper. Some of us need to take care of ourselves physically. We, we need to exercise. We need to eat right. Because we can shorten our life. We need to make sure we get sleep. You know, sometimes there's several reasons why we don't get enough sleep. It's because either we're in, uh, we don't eat right, bad health, sleep apnea, or because we're worrying about things, trying to figure it out in our head. But if you're a man or a woman of prayer, if you're living according to the oracles and the doctrine of Jesus Christ, what does Matthew 6, 33 says? First, seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all things shall be added unto you. Amen? Okay, but flip it around. What if you don't seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness? Then you experience subtraction. And if you're experiencing subtraction in your life, you need to check yourself. Now, granted, not all Christians are going to have, have a, a material wealth, but it doesn't mean that they lack faith or that they lack a right relationship with God. That's not what I'm saying here. But in the grand scheme of it all, you, Christian, are living in America you have every opportunity before you to do anything you want to do, and hopefully it lines up with the will of God, to make good money. Why? To buy a bigger house? To have a big fat bank account? No. And there's nothing wrong with those things. But it's to bless the kingdom of God and to bless other people. People in need. You know, when's the last time you, you've helped somebody pay their light bill? When's the last time you helped somebody pay their water bill? When? When? You know, I don't, I don't have a, a whole lot of money, but I do these things. Anna and I do do these things. And I'm going to tell you why, when, and where, and how. But I do do these things. Why? Because God tells me to. That's why. God tells me to. And I still have a little extra for myself. God blesses you so that you can be a blessing to others. And just as your soul prospers, just as you grow in faith, you should grow in your physical health as well. If you're not in physically good health, there's some reasons why. And a lot of time, it's because your spiritual health is not right. It's connected to each other. Amen? Check yourself. If you're not spiritually healthy, chances are you will not be physically healthy. Check yourself. Verse 3. For I rejoiced greatly when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you, just as you walk in the truth, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Here's the old man John calling these disciples his children. This is the attitude, Christian. Now, listen to this. This is the attitude every Christian should have with their brothers and sisters in Christ, that we are truly family. I have two sisters. It's because of the blood of one man. But you are my brother and sister because of the blood of another man. And his name is Jesus. And his blood outweighs the blood of men. Because our relationship, because of Jesus, will be eternal. Not all of us are going to have siblings that go to be with the Lord because salvation is personal. And so what John is saying in this context of this chapter, he's talking about, well, what do we read about in the previous book? Second John, the world will know my disciples by the love we have for one another, the church. You see the needs of your brothers and sisters in Christ? It's because God wants you to help make a need. If God has shown you a need, has shown you a situation, chances are it's because he wants you to be involved in helping in that situation. He'll never shed light on something and not want you to do anything about it. Now, we got to practice common sense. Sometimes you seek the counsel of others. Back it up. Always seek the counsel of others when you think you want to help somebody and God's leading you to help somebody. Because sometimes it could be a trap too. It could be. 
And sometimes elders of the church know some things that you don't know. Because there are people in the church who drain the church of things. The, the, they're schemers and they're, they're uh, well, what is that word I'm looking for? They just, they con. I have a family member who is known in this entire region for conning churches. And all the churches, when they would say, oh, you're, what's your last name? Michael Garcia. Oh, oh, don't you have? Yeah. Man, that guy did a run on us. So sometimes the elders of church know things. But at the same time, God is still doing his work. He's still doing his work. And look, what binds them together is the truth. Verse 3. It binds the truth. The truth binds them, holds them together. Look at verse 5. He says, Beloved, you do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren and for strangers who have borne witness of your love before the church. If you send them forward on their journey in a manner worthy of God, you will do well because they went forth for his namesake, taking nothing from the Gentiles. We therefore ought to receive such that we may become fellow workers of the truth. Now, what is this saying? In verse 5, 6, 7, and 8, this is basically what this is saying. He's saying, you have had ministers come before your congregation and you've helped meet their needs because they preach the gospel, the truth. Continue to help them. Look, look, look. Read it again. Verse 5. Beloved, you do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren, that's for the church, and for strangers as well. Meaning other, others that, that you may not know, you help them as well. But look, verse 6 says this. These are they who have borne witness of your love before the church. If you send them forward on their journey in a manner worthy of God, you will do well. Because Why? Because these people went forth for God's name's sake. They went forth to do a work in the name of God, taking nothing from the Gentiles, meaning from unbelievers. They were only blessed by the church, not by Gentiles, the unbelievers. It says, we therefore ought to receive such that we may become fellow workers for the truth. The ministry of God, the preaching of the gospel... It takes money. It does. The preaching of the gospel takes faith. But when you support these ministers, he's selling this church. When you support these ministers, guess what? We are in a good place. Hallelujah. Amen? Let's continue reading. It says here in verse 9, I wrote to the church. I wrote to the church. But Diotrephus who loves to have the preeminence among them, does not receive us. Therefore, if I come, if I come, I will call to, his, to mind his deeds, which he does, prating against us with malicious words and not content with that. He himself does not receive the brethren and he forbids those who wish to, putting them out of the church. Now, what is the, this is John he is not saying this in a vengeful spirit, but instead he is being led of the Holy Spirit to warn the church. This man had to be exposed. Now, again, verse 9 and 10, just look at that. He, John is exposing a dangerous man that's in the church. And today, uh, many ministers don't want to do this. And the ones that do expose, they do it with a vengeful, a wrong spirit. But if we just speak out of compassion and love and they're about those who are in the church and they're teaching a false doctrine, they're doing wrong things, then if we're doing it with the right spirit, then God will be glorified and maybe this man will come to a repentance. But it is biblical. John did it and even the Apostle Paul did it several times where they called out false teachers by name. It's not to bring shame, but it's to bring correction. You hear that? And now hear what that says. You don't ever want to bring shame, but you want to bring correction to the situation. If you're trying to shame somebody, shame on you. Amen? Verse 11. Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. He who does good is of God, but he who does evil has not seen God. Why is he saying this in verse 11? Because... Many of the Christian church, 
witnesses the errors and the false teachings of these people. And it could lead us to error or it could lead us to a, a more sincere walk with Jesus. And so when you see somebody fail in the church or whether you see somebody teaching a false doctrine in the church, you should not imitate them, but you should continue to keep your eyes on Jesus and serve and imitate Christ. And so you will bring healing to the situation. And if those people don't want to repent, then God is the one who deals with them. But stand strong, stay put, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ that where he's planted you, he will also allow you to grow. Amen? Amen. 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 Now, verse 12 says this, Demetrius, he's speaking to Demetrius, who is a man of God who probably delivered this letter. He says, Demetrius has a good testimony from all and from the truth itself. And we also bear witness, and you know that our testimony is true. Now look at that. Not only do people speak well of your testimony, church, but even the word of God can speak about you. Look, if I stand up here and preach a false gospel, then it, the, the, the scriptures condemn me. The scriptures speak who I really am. Because the Holy Bible is the standard to what we judge everything by. The Holy Bible has no error. The Holy Bible is inspired of the Holy Spirit, written by men to all of mankind. And if you don't know that word, you're in trouble, especially for the times that we're in today. Because you see, the United States government, the nation that I love, they would love, first and foremost, to put an end to the publishing and the distribution of the Word of God in America. Well, you mean the president? You mean Congress? I'm talking about the true people who are in power. And they are spiritual forces, demonic, in the heavenly realms. They rule the hearts of people who are unsaved, that are in political offices. And just as God can influence a, a godly man or a godly woman, so can the spirit of Satan, the kingdom of Satan. And that is exactly what is happening today. Socialism always gives birth to communism. The goal is not socialism. The goal is communism. And when communism fell in 1990 in Russia. It didn't go away. As a matter of fact, those socialist smart people that left Germany after World War II went and infiltrated our schools, infiltrated our, our, our colleges, and they gave birth in the 60s to what you see now for much, sadly, most of the Democratic Party. So much liberalism and atheism, socialism, which is eventually wanting to give birth to communism. Communism believes in one dictator. And that is exactly the type of government that is in alignment with the final Antichrist. Do you see how the nations are headed? Do you know the word of God? Is your life embedded in the church of Jesus Christ or in the life of your nation? Look to what the Word of God is saying here today. He says, I had many things to write to you, but I do not wish to write to you with pen and ink, but I hope to see you shortly and we shall speak face to face. You know, he said the same thing to the lady in Second John. He wants to see these people face to face. Jesus wants to see you face to face. We need to see God face to face Amen. right now. What I'm talking about, not a, a, a physical appearing of God. I'm talking about, you know, when you look at God and you're not ashamed of your life. When you look at God and you're in the presence of God and there's no shame. There's no hanging down of your head and saying, oh man, you know, I, I could have done it better. 
I, I could have made things better. I could have made life easier for my family. I could have made life easier for my friends. I could have made life easier for the church. I, I could, I could, I could, I could have. Well, let's start doing this. You know what's going to excel every Bible-believing church in the days ahead? You know what it's going to be? I'm going to tell you what it's going to be right now. A love for the truth. A love for the truth. What do you mean a love for the truth? A love for Jesus Christ. Because if you recall, in the book of Revelation, chapter 2, when Jesus speaks to the first church, he speaks to seven churches. But the first church he speaks to, and he says, one thing I hold against you, you have forgotten your first love. Come back. Make it right. The church forgot their first love, and that's Jesus. If we don't have a love for Jesus, a love for the truth, we're not going to be in the truth. If you keep failing, now, now one, a Christian will, every Christian will fail in sin at one point or another. Doesn't give you a reason or a right to. There's a difference between a Christian falling into sin and getting up and repenting and learning and going forward compared to a Christian who, who lives in a habitual lifestyle of sin. They continue to do that evil. There's a major difference. We have that forgiveness from Christ that as we grow, as we mature in the faith, that we will begin to truly, truly experience the love of God because we don't live in the latter, but we live in the, in, in the first. That we continually live in a mindset of repentance. We're always growing, always learning, but we're growing in the faith. We're learning. We're learning as we're going. We're serving as we go. We're sowing seed as we go. And that's the success for every Bible-believing church because God will be glorified. God will be glorified. Amen? Amen. I believe this with all of my heart that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to do and fulfill all that he said he is going to do. I believe that. I believe that Christ is faithful. I believe that the Lord is coming in the twinkle of an eye. And I believe that what John said here, what John said here, that we must abide in the truth. If it was good for the early church, it's going to be good for the end time church. And that is what we are, the end time church. We must abide in the truth. We must know the written word of God. And guess what? You'll have good days and you'll have bad days. But even in the bad days, you'll still have a smile on your face because you're in the truth and you know the truth. And the truth says, in the end, we win because we're in Christ. Amen? Amen. Give God praise in this house. Amen. 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 Amen.